Thanks for stopping by for another episode of MFA Writers. Today is February 14th, so a happy Valentine's Day to those who celebrate. And thanks for spending some of this day with us. We've got a lovely conversation with Caroline Catlin of Pacific University to share with you today that I know you all will love. If you do, reach out and let us know. You can find MFA Writers on Instagram and Twitter as well as MFAWriters.com. We love to hear from listeners, so feel free to shoot us a direct message on one of those platforms or an email at mfawriterspodcast at gmail.com. And if you have a minute to rate or review the show, the best place to do that is on Apple Podcasts. Doing so will help boost our podcast as we try to boost these amazing writers. Also, if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show, you can apply at mfawriters.com. On that same website, you can also click the support button to support us financially, if it's within your means. Or you can do so by going directly to buymeacoffee.com slash MFA writers. Finally, as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to MFA Writers, the podcast where we talk to creative writing MFA students about their program, their process, and a piece they're working on. I'm your host, Jared McCormick. Today, I'm with Caroline Catlin. Caroline is a writer, photographer, and care worker who believes in the power and impact of shared truths. Her work has previously been published in the New York Times, Teen Vogue, Glamour, Long Reads, and elsewhere. Caroline is currently in her final semester of Pacific University's MFA in writing program. Her focus has been on nonfiction-related work. However, she's a big fan of learning from the poets and fiction writers as well. Caroline's 2020 TED Talk, Why I Photographed the Quiet Moments of Grief and Loss, has been viewed over one million times. Today, Caroline has brought a nonfiction piece to read for us titled, What I Learned Photographing Death. A nurse hands me a sterile blue gown, a mask, and thin covers for my shoes. I coat my hands in sanitizer, feeling the stick of the liquid on my camera's dials. I scan the space, my eyes noting the woman on the operating table, and make a quick calculation of where the light hits each corner, which parts of the room are too dark to photograph. I volunteer about three times a month with Solumination, a nonprofit organization that provides free photo sessions for terminal adults and families with critically ill children in hospitals around Washington State. The photo shoots can document individuals at any stage of illness, but sometimes we are asked to document the end of a child's life. When I enter a hospital room as a photographer, I stand ready to pay attention, ready to capture the way that love honors the dying. Witnessing these small moments helps me come to terms with my own mortality. In October, after three years of unexplained headaches, fatigue, and worsening memory loss, I persuaded a doctor to order an exploratory MRI, which revealed a mass in my right parietal lobe. Three months later, following a craniotomy to remove the golf ball-sized tumor, I sat on crinkled paper on an exam table and waited to hear the pathology results. My parents, who had flown across the country, waited with me, I watched as my mom's leg shook in the seat and my dad took his glasses on and off. I kept waiting for them to grab hands, but they didn't. Eventually, the doctor entered the room with the news that the tumor was not benign as expected, but malignant. My story took a turn. The plans I had to become a social worker or a photojournalist were replaced with a list of treatments for grade 3 anaplastic astrocytoma brain cancer. Six weeks of daily radiation six months to a year of chemo, possibly another craniotomy. Within a month, the hair on the right side of my head fell out, leaving a bald spot next to my C-shaped scar. I'm 27. The type of cancer I have is incurable. The fact that I am sick and young has helped me form new connections with the people I am photographing. During a session with a teenager who would be stopping cancer treatment soon, I offered to take my hat off if she took off hers we'd be balled together. In the operating room with a woman in labor, a floor above where it had surgery four months earlier, I took a test shot of the waiting plastic bassinet lined with blue and pink striped blankets. The long labor turned into a C-section and the mother was exhausted. Her head rested on the operating table, 
a blue plastic curtain protecting her stomach from view. The infant had a congenital hernia that had prevented his lungs from developing properly. The doctors were unsure whether he'd live a few moments, a few hours, or a few days. I stood behind the mother's head with the camera waiting, careful not to knock over any of the medical equipment that surrounded us. Above the curtain, I could see the shoulders and heads of the surgeons as they pushed down on her stomach. The mother groaned from the pressure. With one pull, they lifted a baby into the air above the curtain, slick with blood. The baby's grandmother stood to see him and placed a hand on her heart for the split second he was visible before he was moved to the bassinet and a crowd of doctors descended upon him. He was perfect, but he did not cry. I watched as his mouth opened and closed silently. I adjusted the dials on my camera to focus on his tiny clenched fists and his matted curly hair, letting the tubes, wires, and gloved hands blur in the background. Let's bring him to his mama, the doctor said. I was there as they lay him on his mother's chest. There, just moments later, as his pink skin began to turn to dusk and his mouth stopped reaching for air. His arm was gentle across his mother's face. I clicked the shutter to save this gesture. And then she wailed so deeply that I felt my own bruised grief meet me in the room. It is a peculiar thing to step into someone's worst day with a camera in hand. There's no rule book for how best to navigate it. There was no one to tell me when to stay or when to step out on my first end of life shoot. When I hovered in a hospital room as a family said goodbye to their three-year-old girl dying from a rare metabolic disorder. Often I am asked why I choose to photograph the end of a child's life. When I am in these rooms, I am present with the sole goal of finding the moments within grief that feel the most gentle and human. Watching a mother brush the hair of her dying child, I was able to recognize the love and tenderness that accompanies us, even in death. Listening to a child cry over the loss of his sister, and then get back up and start playing again next to her body, reminded me of the resilience we all carry with us that my family and friends are capable of as well. They will also continue to live on if I die too soon. Those who have traveled to that pitch black room of grief into the depths of it know well how in our most horrific of moments, we are met with small pricks of bright light, piercing and strong. I carry my points of light with me every day. The ICU nurse who helped me take my first shower after surgery chemo care packages that have shown up at my doorstep for each round of poison, the abundance of groceries ordered for my family in the days after my diagnosis. Martine Prechtel says in his book, The Smell of Rain on Dust, grief is praise because it is the natural way love honors what it misses. In facing the reality of a shortened life, I like to remind myself that grief is centered not in pain, but in love. The families I work with often don't learn my name. I am the quiet presence in the background, stepping in only to save the image they will want to hold on to later. I have no communication with them once I leave, despite having spent hours at the bedside of their dying child. There is nothing left between me and them but the images, the precious evidence of a bright life lost but loved fiercely. At night, editing the photos alone on my computer, I often light a candle and turn on music. I click through the set, adjusting the brightness, the cropping, pouring careful attention into each one. I save a folder with each child's photos and send them off to the organization to be delivered to the families in the form of photo books and gifts. And then, before I shut down the computer and climb into bed, I sit for a moment, alone with the images, feeling the weight of each loss matched only by the magnitude of each family's love for their child, just as I hope someone would do for me. Caroline, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a beautiful story and a beautifully written piece, and thanks again for sharing it with us. Thank you. It's such a unique unique thing that you do. Honestly, I didn't know or even imagine that this was a thing that people did, taking photos at the end of people's lives. And so I'm curious to know how you got into this. Like, when did this start and what made you want to do it? 
Yeah, you know, I wasn't aware this was a thing that people did either. Um, when I was in the hospital, I was I was really aware of how many people had kind of significant stories happening for them and significant moments. And I, it seemed to me that their stories and their desire to share and these kind of moments that felt so um, complicated in the sense that they were both really beautiful and really difficult um, were kind of spilling out of them. Like I would go in these elevators, especially after I left inpatient hospital and uh, would come back for appointments and I would be in the elevator and people would just kind of spill their story to me. Like they would say things like my husband, my husband didn't come home last week. I'm hoping he gets to be discharged this week Wow. and sort of to themselves and sort of to me, you know, and I, I guess I noticed that this was um, a place that people were holding a lot. And so I would, um, I asked the children's hospital if it was an option to um, offer free photo shoots to families. And they said that they actually had an organization they worked with for that. And it was called Solumination. And um, they connected me with them. And then when I interviewed with them, you know, they were like, we often do kind of happy photo shoots or like memorable moments, but we also sometimes have end of life um, requests. And would you be open to that? And I really had no idea what to expect, but I was, I was like, yeah bring it, <laughs> you know, like I right. am always someone that's kind of like, I want, I want to dive into this. So, right. um, yeah, that's how it started. I mean, the photos by themselves are very moving, but when you put words to them, it just makes it all the more powerful. So which came first for you? Were you writing first or were you a photographer first and what mo motivated you to combine the two in this way? Yeah, I think that I was, I don't think I was one kind of first or before the other. I, as a child, I really loved um, writing. I often was writing as, as a young kid. And then I think um, once I knew there was such a thing as a camera or I, you know, got my first kind of uh, crappy phone that could take pictures, I started right. <laughs> <laughs> following that too. And I think for me, um, I think both in story and in frames. I like kind of see both in story and in frames too, in terms of, um, and there's so much relationship between the two in terms of what you choose to include in a piece of work or art and what you leave out. And I think they just feel deeply related and woven together for me. And they're like different ways of looking at the same thing. So um, I think it's been interesting Instagram is actually one of the social media platforms where I feel like you're asked to pair photo and writing in the in, like consistently. And that's been an interesting experience because I do think sometimes for posts there, because I have an Instagram specific for kind of my cancer and chronic illness and end of life photography experience. And I think sometimes I'll have this moment where I'm like, okay, I have a photo what, is, what do I want to say or the other way around? And I kind of like the challenge of kind of, you know, of being needed to needing to match them. Right. Well, we'll be sure to put your Instagram accounts on our website so listeners can find those. Um, you told me that as a child, you told your mom that you always had a story happening in your head, which first off is very cute and <laughs> is something that I think a lot of us can relate to. Uh, growing up, how important was writing and storytelling to your understanding of the world? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's funny that I said that because I think my mom was probably like, okay, <laughs> I'm not sure what you're talking about, but I, I grew up in a really small town in rural Vermont, um, like a farming town. And my family was very outdoorsy and, um, loved, you know, being in the snow and skiing and all this stuff. And I was often like, okay, well, I'll go to the ski resort, but can I please bring a book? Like I often, yeah. <laughs> whatever we were doing, I was like, but also could I read? Um, and I loved, I loved reading so much. And I think reading has been kind of the biggest thing that has made me want to write um, because I, I have often felt so pulled into the world of stories. And I would also listen to, um, you know, like audiobooks that at that time were more book on tapes um to like kind of feel the words um and yeah and then I would start 
I think in like third or fourth grade, I started writing and I went to this, you know, really tiny public school in rural Vermont, but there were some teachers that were so encouraging of storytelling. And I, I really think that has made a huge impact on me. And I even have on my website, like a, a page just for gratitude. And I've listed almost every teacher or mentor that's been impactful for me, because I think that's so important to recognize. And that's how we get where we are, you know? So yeah, I think that combination. I also grew up in a very small rural town and um, we actually lived like even outside of that town. So uh, we had like one of those giant metal antennas on top of our house that would that would get like NBC, CBS <laughs> and ABC if it was cloudy. <laughs> so the amount of days that I spent outside just making up stories in my head, I couldn't possibly even count them. Yeah. I did the same thing and I, I, my poor little brothers were subject to like a lot of my yeah. imagination <laughs> ideas. I was like, today we're going to be whatever it was and yeah. we kind of had to go along with it. <laughs> well, as we learned in your reading, you went through your own cancer diagnosis and treatment and I was hoping you could talk about the role that writing and storytelling has played in your life since that diagnosis. Yeah, I mean, it really changed my you know, the trajectory of my career path. I think I had wanted, I had been splitting my time between um, more, you know, care work, mental health work and writing and photography. And when I was diagnosed, it felt so much more urgent to, to tell a story. Um, and I think that it stopped, it's, it shifted from being something that I love to do to something that I felt was, kind of like critical for me. Um, and so I started writing about my experience largely just to kind of have it held somewhere besides just my brain. And then it ended up becoming something that I noticed um, felt really impactful for people. And I, you know, I, I've also experienced a lot of kind of complex and unclear chronic illness and chronic pain in my life. And I think both of those things people relate to in a really different way, like the experience of ongoing mysterious illness and the experience of a kind of life-changing diagnosis. And I've just found it to be so helpful for me, both to for myself to write my story and also the connections I've made through it have really been rewarding and really changed my life. Well, you have some really diverse interests related to writing. You told me that you enjoy writing journalism, creative nonfiction, and sometimes poetry. So what motivates you to write one versus the other? Do you go through phases where you just work on one or are you constantly moving back and forth depending on what inspires you at a given time? That's such a good question because I do feel like it's um, the genre can often just be an entry point and Nonfiction is probably the area in which I most often feel comfortable. I like the challenge of journalism because often you need to shape your work around a specific publications, um, you know, like voice. And I, I really love the challenge of trying to match that. Um, in terms of poetry, I, I actually don't, I don't really feel like a very good poet, but I do <laughs> love that it becomes this way that I can, um, maybe talk about something sideways <laughs> until I'm able to talk about it in a different way. And I reading poetry is what helps me be the best writer in, that I can be. I think it really uh, opens my, my mind and my like access to words in a different way. So I really value reading it for sure. Yeah. I'm the same way. I love reading poetry and I try to write it sometimes, but I also feel like <laughs> it's so hard to do. I know. Poets are magic. Yeah, lots of respect for the poets listening, for sure. And what about reading? So what kinds of things do you like to read? And do you find that what you read influences what you write? Oh, definitely. I I have always been someone that, without entirely meaning to, mimics the style of what I've just read. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. But I notice it down to like the sentence structure for me. Um, which is kind of fun because all, it feels like it, it, it opens a different way of 
writing I didn't know I could do. Um, right. And I'll write, you know, my own story, but I'll write it in the same like kind of cadence and beat of whatever I just read. So I love that. I read kind of a wide variety of things, but I really, I read a lot of memoir. I'm trying to read more fiction because it's the storytelling is such a uh, unique and different and expansive thing within that. And I'm, I'm just fascinated by how people make that happen. So um, yeah, I feel like I read a, and I read a lot of poetry too. Yeah. Any emerging writers out there? I'm always surprised. I mean, I'm, I, predominantly write fiction, but I'm always surprised at what I learn or how I'm inspired when I read nonfiction or if I read poetry or other forms as well. Yeah, we definitely learn from our peers and and from different ways that people construct because ultimately we're all telling stories and it's just a way of, yeah, how do you access those stories? So when it actually comes time to write, what is your process like? Do you have any routines or rituals that help you get into the writing zone? Yeah. Well, I wish I had more (laughs) because it's often really hard for me to get in that space. I will say what works best is to, I write best in the morning. Um, I try to read for 20 minutes before I write. Um, and I think that really helps, especially if I read something that's kind of challenging me to think of, uh, a different way of writing. Um, and then I find that I can drop into my own work a lot better. That's such a good idea. I also write, try to write first thing in the morning, but sometimes I don't know. It's like my brain needs to get revved up and the coffee hasn't quite kicked in yet. So the, the writing, uh, takes a little while to get going, but maybe I like the idea of reading for 20 or 30 minutes in the morning before I start writing. I might try that. Yeah. And I also find that if I can't focus on reading, because it takes me a while to get, wake up, I will just listen to an audiobook, um, kind of even why, while I'm doing other things. And um, a really, a really good audiobook or a really good author to listen to on audiobook is Toni Morrison. Uh, she, a lot of the audiobook she narrates, and I find that I don't even entirely need to track what's happening in each section to feel the kind of the words like settle into me. I mean, she's such a poet. um, Yeah. Right. uh, On a a line level. And so I find it really helpful. You started your graduate school career in a master of social work program before deciding to pursue the MFA. So what motivated that change and what did you hope to get out of an MFA program? You know, I started my MSW a month before we found the tumor Um, and I was really struggling in school. I was, uh, I couldn't keep up. And so when we found the tumor, I obviously had to, um, take time off, even though we didn't know it was malignant yet. But then I think I, when I I tried to return to that program when I graduated and it was, you know, the onset of COVID and all these things. And I was finding it so hard to be on screens in that way all the time. And I also, was thinking about it, honestly, from a disability perspective of being like, I, I cannot work the hours that an MSW is asking of me. Um, and at the same time I was, um, having a lot of opportunity to, in my writing career and, um, and, and I felt like a lot was taking off for me in that way. And so, yeah, I just, I was, um, kind of inspired to, follow that track. I think I was writing a lot and I had, um, someone who was mentoring me and she was like, you know, you, you could try an MFA, like, why don't you give it a go? And so I, yeah, I took a chance. What were your goals in pursuing the MFA? Like, what did you hope to get out of that program? I would say there was a lot I hoped to get out of it. Um, but I didn't really know what it was. (laughs) Right. I I think a lot of people don't. Yeah, I was really not sure what to expect. I wanted, you know, I had been working on a project that I was hoping would become a book and I wanted the consistency and I wanted someone to kind of, um, I wanted there to be a system that was pushing me to keep going. Right. Um, and I also wanted to be inspired, not just by my kind of the faculty, but also by my peers. I wanted a writing community. And so I think that was, those were all things that kind of led me to, to go in that direction. Yeah, I think that makes total sense. I I also didn't really know what to expect when entering the MFA program. Mostly I just 
wanted the community and I wanted to be around people who had made a career out of writing so that I could absorb some of their knowledge. But I wasn't really sure what I was going to get out of the MFA program before I went. Yeah, I definitely didn't know what to expect. And um, I've, I've been so grateful I've made that, that this choice, but I, yeah, I wasn't sure what I was getting into. I kind of took a leap of faith. Yeah. Well, after the social work program, you started one MFA, but attended that school for only a semester before transferring to the Pacific University MFA program you're in now. I'd like to talk about that a bit, if you don't mind, since I don't think many MFA students even consider this to be an option, but more people transfer from one MFA program to another than you might think. So could you tell us about your decision to transfer and what that experience was like? Yeah, definitely. I The school I started at, I really loved um, when I started. There were a lot of faculty and um, the head of school was someone I really liked. And then around like, midway through my first semester, things really became shifting, not just within the MFA program, but also on kind of the larger university. Uh, and I found myself feeling... Um, Like I wouldn't have kind of a good match for an advisor. It was also a low residency program like Pacific is. And I was concerned that I wouldn't have a good match for an advisor as a lot of faculty were leaving. Um, And so I decided to, to try to look elsewhere. I, it's, it's kind of wild how I found Pacific because I was looking at, uh, I was looking at transferring to a different um, state version of my first school because it was in two different states, and I was also looking at uh, a, another a completely different um, MFA program, and I was really debating between kind of what I felt like were the, those two options, and I had a really good friend from my first program who. Uh, just is like a magical soul and was like, you know what? I think there's going to be a third option that you don't even know about yet. (laughs) And I was like, okay, sure. And then um, someone, like someone just sent me a link to Pacific's website and I didn't even kind of uh, know about it. And um, I called that day and I think Scott, the director answered the phone and was like, so lovely and so kind and was like, actually, we're having a re- an info session for new students in about an hour. Want to come? <laughs> and I was like, yes. And so I came, I, you know, I, I came to their Zoom info session and I just it was pretty quickly hooked. I felt like the community was so supportive and rich and like not, not competitive, like cheerleaders for each other in such a lovely way. And so, yeah, that really kind of solidified my decision. So having gone through that experience of transferring from one MFA program to another, do you have any advice for people who might be considering this option but are a little nervous about it? Totally. I Well, one thing is that um, different MFA programs have different ways they um, kind of map out the credits between semesters. Um, so that ended up being kind of a tricky thing to navigate. And the other thing I learned is that most of the time you actually can't transfer any credits. Most MFA programs will, will let you transfer after one semester, but not more than one, uh, which makes sense because they're often two or three years or whatever it is. So um, if you are, I think, if folks are considering transferring, either trying to do so before they get to their second or third semester or being willing to lose lose a, a semester of credits, which is not ideal. So I think keeping that in mind and really talking to both schools, the school you are currently at and the new one about how they map out their credit system and, and what makes the most sense. So you transferred after one semester and you were able to use those credits from that first semester and they counted yeah. towards your MFA at Pacific. Yes. Uh, s- well, sort of. <laughs> I had started, I was like a month into my next semester, my second semester at the first school, um, which sort of ended up helping because it ended, like, I think, I don't remember exactly, but I think that one of the schools had like more credits than the other first semester or something like that. So it ended up working out really well, but um it doesn't, it's always, it's, I don't think it always does. I think it's tricky. And I, Pacific was so um, kind of understanding and adjusting to that, which is really, really great. Yeah. 
Okay, so something to think about and look into if you're considering it. Um, there's a chance that some of your credits from the first program won't transfer. So you might have to start over or take a slight step back if you're going to go to a new program. Yes, exactly. And I would say that most of the time it's, it would probably be tricky to transfer from like a low residency model to a full-time model. Like I, I'm not, because I think the credits work really differently um, because I, for example, I had already done my residency for the next semester at um, the first school. So I could like kind of carry that over, but it's, you know, the, the low residency model is just made up in a different way than some other schools. Right. So. Well, Pacific University's Master of Fine Arts and Writing program is, like you said, a low residency program that offers degrees in fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. The program's two years long and consists of five intensive residencies as well as four semesters of guided study. One concern that students have when considering a low residency MFA, I think, is whether or not there will be a strong sense of community since the students aren't together all the time. But you told me that Pacific puts a lot of thought and effort into community building. So what has that looked like from the student perspective? And do you feel like you've been able to establish a strong community with your fellow students? Yeah, I, I definitely do. You know, I think it was it was a much harder, but I think for every school when it was when we were kind of in the heart of the pandemic, because, um, you know, we couldn't have that. Re- I think for low residency programs, that in-person 10 day intensive residency is really like kind of the heart of the program and the semester. And so not being able to have that in person was really hard. But since we've had two in person, it's just been, you know, really life changing. And I I think a lot of. It, you know, the residencies feel like both writing boot camp and like summer camp somehow. <laughs> and so it's like you really get close with people there and you really um, get kind of immersed in this inspiration and this world of words, really. And then Pacific's done a great job of hosting things like um, student readings, uh, I think at least every every month um, online. And they will also, you know, I'm in a writing workshop group with um, some other people in the nonfiction uh, genre because we just wanted to keep in touch and keep working on our writing together. And I think it just fosters a sense of community that really encourages any forming of groups and every kind, any version of connection, we can kind of continue on. And we get a monthly email um, about any events or any upcoming, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it might be related to Pacific. And then I think the third thing that Pacific does really well is um, they very much cheerlead for their faculty and, and students. And that can mean like they send out links to when someone's having a, a reading or a book signing, whatever it is. And I think that's really import, an important way for us to support each other, even when we're not together. Well, speaking of the residencies, I noticed that Pacific's program actually starts with a residency. So you you actually have five throughout the course of the program. It sounds to me like because of the pandemic, maybe you didn't get to have that first one in person. But I'm curious to hear what you have to say about the benefits of having a residency to start the program. Yeah, I mean, I think that it feels like a fresh start. It feels like... A, a way to enter into a new semester feeling really excited um, because you're exposed to so many different, you know, you're in a genre based workshop, but then you're also able to go to classes of any genre and you can, there's a bunch of the faculty readings every night and student readings every night. And um, I think it just is such, and you know, our conversations with each other are so often around, what we're excited about. And I, and so I think just like when you're approaching the semester where you're like, wow, I'm going to feel like I'm really working hard sometimes by myself, having this feeling of cohesion and support is, is so helpful to kind of start you off on the right foot. So beyond those relationships with your fellow students, have you been able to establish some strong relationships with faculty and staff as well? Definitely. Um, I mean, I think one thing that feels great is the kind of, you know, the director and everybody involved with the more administrative side of things is so accessible and such big writing fans themselves. And so that feels like 
that feels really nice. There doesn't, I don't think there always feels like this big separation between the people who are making the program happen and the faculty and the students. Um, so that's been nice. And my advisors have been really lovely every term. Um, I worked last term with the author Claire Dieterer and she was just so brilliant. And, um, I just feel like I learned so much, um, from her and from, all the people I've gotten to work with and in the different workshops, you're not always, you can be with any member of faculty in your genre. So it's nice. You kind of get to meet a lot of people and work with a lot of people. What do you think the benefits have been to having different advisors for each term? Yeah. You know, I, everybody has such a different way of approaching the work that they're doing and the way, actually, I think one of the most helpful things is the way that each different advisor looks at your work, um, the kind of lens from which they approach your work is so different. And that's been really helpful because everybody, it, it helps you get like a balanced view of what a reader, a, you know, what your readers might feel. And that's, that's been really cool. And everybody has a different skill set and, and area of strength. So I feel like uh, the collaboration has been really cool. Outside of residencies, what does a typical week look like when you're working from home? Do you attend weekly Zoom classes? Are you in regular contact with professors and advisors? It sort of depends on the advisor. I think everybody has kind of a different way they like to be in communication or a different amount they like to be in communication. But the the standard protocol is that we have different um, like packet due dates throughout the semester. So we'll work kind of independently on our, on our work, um, for maybe like a month, month and a half. And then we turn in everything to our advisors. And then within a week, we usually hear back either via phone call or via letters and notes on our work. Um, but then like I, like I said, Pacific also will have like student readings or different events happening that you can attend via Zoom. And you touched on the residencies a bit earlier, but uh, I'm curious to hear you talk a bit more about that. So like how long are the residencies and what does a typical schedule look like? Yeah, they are 10 days long. Um, the For Pacific, the summer residency is in their campus in Forest Grove, Oregon, and the winter one is in Seaside, Oregon, both which have been just beautiful. Um, yeah. But then... Yeah, really like the whole the whole walking on the beach after a poetry reading is <laughs> is hard to beat. <laughs> but um yeah, I think the day, you know, you wake up there's often there's craft talks that happen maybe 3 times a day. And those are about an hour long and it's a faculty member presenting on a specific element of craft. Um and so we go to that and then we usually have morning workshop that are kind of our intensive workshop group. So that's um, with a group of maybe five other students and a faculty member or two faculty members. And you're bringing, you, you've already turned, we turn in like a month before things we want to work on. And then everybody reads it and we kind of workshop together each day. Each person gets a day. And then we, uh, you know, we'll have later in the, in the 10 days, we'll have, um, classes and those can be kind of like a one-time thing and either they're you can you know sometimes they're really generative sometimes they're more like mini craft talks that are more kind of um like small groups and then at night we usually have uh faculty readings and then student readings both of which are very well attended like I would say I mean, I'm not surprised that all the faculty readings are very well attended, but it's been so lovely to see people, they're just like half the school at least, show up for student readings at night and like really cheer for each other. That's been really sweet to see. Another thing I wanted to ask you about was funding, which can be a bit of a sticky issue with low residency programs mm -hmm. because most MFA programs fund students through teaching, but since low res students aren't in person all the time. Those opportunities aren't always available. Uh, I did see, though, that Pacific offers several scholarships, including at least one fully funded scholarship for an underrepresented writer. So what do you know about funding opportunities at Pacific? Yeah, um, I do know there's there are scholarships that have been really helpful for folks. I um, have not been in a situation where I needed to or 
decided to apply for one. Um, but I knew, know they do have some, some opportunities that have been really helpful for folks. And I'd also say they're very, um, willing to work with you and, and make it feel as accessible as possible. There is like a payment plan option so that you can break up, um, tuition payment over several months and different things like that, that I think have been really helpful. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I think the biggest issue with MFA programs, not just Pacific, but in, in the world is that they can be really inaccessible for a lot of writers. And I, I think that's like a kind of ongoing conversation, but it doesn't feel like one that is not um, something we can talk about at Pacific. I think, I think that's really important to talk about the privilege it is in general to be able to attend an MFA program. And I, I don't feel like that is um, like something we don't, we don't, we ignore you know, which is important. I really, I think it really is. Yep. And I think that that's good advice because often these programs, I think, have more money than they let on. So Mm. sometimes it's just a matter of asking and saying, hey, I, I need this in order to be able to do this. Yeah, totally. So you mentioned earlier that you didn't really have expectations going into the MFA program, or you didn't know what to expect. But I'm still going to ask my final question that I ask everyone, which is, what is one way in which the MFA experience has been different for better or for worse from the expectations you had when applying? I mean, I think that the biggest thing has been like learning that even if I have all the scaffolding in the world in terms of like someone's waiting for my work to come in and I have expect expectations every month or whatever it is, it's still on me to find a way to create a schedule and a a work structure that means I turn in work. And I think that sounds really obvious, but I think I... I I am I like forgot (laughs) or didn't consider that I would still really need to show up and 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 put the pressure on myself um, because that's ultimately and I I do think that's a benefit of low residency because I think it's it's a good way that you're learning how to have a career as a writer Um, because you're not in classes all the time you're not necessarily seeing in communication with someone every day so it's up to us to figure out like how do we structure our days or other jobs or our families around being able to write? And that's been a really big learning curve for me. And one I'm honestly still figuring out, I think it's something I'm, I'll probably always be kind of fine tuning, but yeah. that's, I think something I didn't think about before. And it's a good lesson for all of us as we leave MFA programs, finding time yeah. to write, even when we have careers and jobs that we have to worry about yes, as well. Yes, Definitely. Well, Caroline, it has been really lovely to talk to you. I feel really privileged to have you stop by and share your story with us. So thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for having me. It was it was such a great experience to also just get to talk about um, the MFA. I, I don't think I've always been able to have that kind of uh, space, and I'm really grateful to this program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.